Which one? They're not on yet. Oh. Okay. <laughs> look at it, look at it. All right, um, court will call uh, 20 CR 1358, People versus Letitia Stalk. Record should reflect the jury is not present in the courtroom. <clears throat> I've been advised that the jury has reached uh, verdicts in this case. Before I bring the jury in, I want to remind everybody of a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, if you have a phone out, put it away, unless you are in the front row. The judge has emotion. Um, in addition, um, I know that this is an emotional case. I get that. I understand that really I do, um, but this jury has worked hard. Um, so regardless of whether you agree with or don't agree with their verdict, um, you need to exercise um, appropriate decorum. Um, so let's not have any emo emotional outbursts or anything like that. Um, and I think we're good to go. <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead and bring the jury in now that I have you doing something else. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> but they all seem to be on. Okay, how's that? The the lights are definitely on. Perimeter lights are on, you guys. So they've got the judge's camera is not on yet. It doesn't matter to me if I see it. So, so long as it's broadcasting, I just wanted to make sure that was not the issue. Oh, she's looking nervous. <clears throat> oh, no, she's looking nervous, you guys. Here we go. Where's the judge? Oh, the judge's camera is probably. All oh, rise for the jury, please. Okay, 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 okay. She's ready. <laughs> Guilty shot. <laughs> Thank you. May I be seated? Here we go. Court will recall 20 CR 1358, People versus Letitia Stalk. Record should reflect the jury has returned to the courtroom. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I see that juror number five, that would be you, um, has all the instructions and things like that. That's usually a tip off to me that you might be the four person. Are you in fact the four person? And has the jury reached verdicts in this case? All right, if you would hand the instructions and the verdict forms to Mr. Sproul, please. <coughs> Thank you. Turn the judge's camera on. All right, the verdict forms do appear to be in proper order. <laughs> Um, I will have a, a question uh, for you because there's some extra writing on here, but I think I understand what's going on. So um, with respect to count number one, charge of murder in the first degree after deliberation, we, the jury, find the defendant, Letitia Stauk, guilty of count number one, murder in the first degree after deliberation. With respect to count number two, Charge of murder in the first degree, child under 12, by a person in a position of, of trust. We, the jury, find the defendant, Letitia Stauk, guilty of count number two, murder in the first degree, child under 12, position of trust. With respect to count number three, uh, charge of tampering with a deceased human body, we, the jury, find the defendant, Letitia Stauk, guilty of count number three, tampering with a deceased human body. With respect to count number four, charge of tampering with physical evidence, we, the jury, find the defendant, Letitia Stauk, guilty of count number four, tampering with physical evidence. 
Um, I wanted to ask the jury, uh, or actually the foreperson, there is some extra writing on here with respect to uh, question number one, there's a cross through and some initials. And then on part B, there's also a cross through with initials. Was that signifying that you were not answering that and you intended to answer guilty as to that charge? Yes. All right. And uh, is that what you intended with all of the other verdict forms? Yes. All right. Um, with that, does either side wish to have the jury poll the prosecution? Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> All right, what this means is that uh, this is a process that is sometimes requested by the attorneys following a verdict to make sure that everybody has agreed on all parts of it. So I'll go down the row, starting in the back. Juror number one, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number two, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number three, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number four, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number five, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number six, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number seven, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number eight, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number nine, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number 10, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number 11, is this and are these your verdicts? Juror number 12, is this and are these your verdicts? I want to thank all of you uh, for your service. Jurors don't get a lot of training. However, you all were selected because you were willing to be open-minded and impartial and were willing to make decisions based on the facts and the law. You, the jury, heard and saw the evidence. You paid attention all day, every day. Someone else may tell you they disagree with or uh, they disagree with your verdict or some aspect of your service. They may want to express their opinion on the matter. However, we didn't ask them for any of their opinions. We asked you for your judgment. We asked you for your verdict based on the law and based on the evidence. Someone else may tell you they think they're better and smarter and more intuitive than all of you were. Ignore them. As a judge, rarely does a day go by that I don't make somebody in the courtroom mad. The fact that some people may disagree with your verdict or the law only means that those who disagree with you were not carefully selected to be fair and impartial. They did not take an oath to follow the law and to judge all of the facts and they see it differently from you because they didn't see it all from the perspective you did. And they did not discuss the facts with 11 others who were also fair and impartial and sworn to follow the law. You decided this case. This verdict is your verdict. And this is the verdict in the case. No poll, no approval or disapproval, and no press analysis changes that fact. This is the verdict in the case. The press or someone else at some point may wish to talk to you. We live in a world of exceptional voyeurism in reality TV, and this is about as real as it gets. They may try to dissect the evidence, your thought process, and your decision. It's a free country. Anyone can ask you anything about your verdict. You can answer if you choose. They can also, however, respect your privacy and allow you to contact them only if you want to talk to them. And if you don't want to, you don't have to talk to anyone about your verdict. If you do talk with someone, you can tell them as little or as much as you like. Someone may even ask you to give an affidavit regarding some aspect of your jury service. You're free to give an affidavit. You're free to decline to give an affidavit. That is a personal decision you are entitled to make. If anyone 
continues to talk to you after you have told them you do not want to speak about the matter or becomes critical of you or your jury service, please report that incident to me. Again, I want to thank you very much for your service. Without honest people of our community serving on jurors, we cannot secure the right to a jury trial in this country. And it's a very valuable and a very important right. I want to leave you with some language from a case that was decided by the United States Supreme Court in Louisiana versus Duncan. In that case, um, an individual was denied the right to a jury by trial or a trial by jury, sorry. And that case went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court sent it back to the state of Louisiana. And it said, you need to give this man what the Constitution requires, which is a tr uh, trial by jury. And when it sent the case back to Louisiana, it said, we believe the trial by jury is fundamental to the American scheme of justice. Trial by jury is more than an instrument of justice and more than one wheel of the Constitution. It is the lamp that shows that freedom lives. Without your dedication and sacrifice, that lamp would not shine as brightly as it does. So I, I truly thank you for your service. You are now discharged with the thanks of the court. And for the last time, all rise for the jury, please. Thank you. You may all be seated. Um, I don't know how you want to proceed uh, on sentencing. I do need to talk to the jury uh, for a few minutes because I need to tell them some things about um, security issues, counseling issues, and things like that. So I do need to talk with them uh, for a few minutes. I also didn't know if uh, the family, the prosecution, uh, anybody um, wanted to have some time to process the verdicts. I also understand that everybody's been here for five weeks, so I get that part too. So I'm open to whatever you want to do uh, with respect to sentencing, um, but I probably am going to need at least a half an hour with the jury. I think that would be appropriate, Judge. Um, the people are obviously ready to go to immediate sentencing. I believe defenses as well. Yeah. And, okay. and I can tell you that the family's been um, thinking about this day for over three years. They're ready to go to sentencing as well. Okay. Then give me about 30 minutes uh, and we will come back and proceed to sentencing at that point in time. All right. Man, the judge's camera is not on today. There you could see um, Al right here. I'll just try to zoom in a bit. Oh, man. Okay. Stayed until the court is Nicole. All right. And I'll have each person uh, spell the name for the court report. Yes. All right. Just step up to the uh, podium there and just state your name. Sound is on you have victim statements. Nicole Mobley, N I C O L E M O B L E Y. I just want to initially thank you for everything that you've done through all of this, as well as the prosecution. Um, I'm this has been well over three years of a family, as well as hundreds or thousands of us who have gone through a lot. Um, it's been hard. It's been heartbreaking. And to finally see some kind of justice, especially for his family, is incredible. And I just want to thank everybody for everything that you guys have done. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. 
Jane. They said the judge's mic wasn't on, but you can hear now, right? We can all hear. I can hear. <clears throat> Hello, Your Honor. My name is Janie Cadenas. All right. Can you spell that last name? C A D E N A S. Okay, go ahead. Also, like what Nicole said, wanted to thank you for making this such a fair and neutral trial through the process. Um, I am here today, as I have sat with the family for the last three years as a community member in Larson Ranch, who has watched the turmoil that this has caused everybody in our community. Three years ago, we heard as a neighborhood what happened that a little boy went missing and we rallied together in a way that most communities can never experience or imagine we came together and we helped find ways to get media involved to get search parties involved to do everything we could to be of assistance to find this little boy because gannon wasn't just a neighbor he was all of our little boys for months and months until he was found, we were all scared to let our kids go outside because we were scared that they would be kidnapped. We didn't know what was going to happen. And through that process, we all came together and we met Landon and Al, those of us that didn't know them, and we built relationships and friendships and, and garnered a family relationship with them through that process. But this is just one thing that as a community member, somebody who was a part of it from the beginning, that I can confidently say, this is the worst tragedy that anybody could ever go through and every parent's nightmare. And I have watched and held Landon as she falls apart time after time. <clears throat> but we are here today and justice has finally been served for Gannon. And I, we want to thank you as a community for that opportunity for this to happen today. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. My name is Jeff Davenport, J-E-F-F-D-A-V-E-N-P-O-R-T. Right. Um, I am Gannon's great uncle. Um, I'm Albert's uncle and my sister, Debbie, who hopefully will be spoken, speaking in a few minutes is his grandmother. Uh, because I am a couple of steps away from him in relation, um, even though uh, I have personal memories of Gannon and the, the loving, wonderful young man that he was and the great man he would have been, um, I want to leave the depth of impact to his parents. Uh, so I would like to talk about um, the breadth of impact. Um, the preciousness of an 11-year-old's life is beyond measure and all other impacts to all the rest of us pale in comparison to the loss he suffered himself. Um, but this now convicted murderer um, did not just murder Gannon. She murdered all of the love and joy and encouragement and security he would have brought to all those he encountered throughout his life. She murdered his children and his grandchildren and all of the joy and love and encouragement and security they would have brought to all those they encountered throughout their life and so on and so on she murdered his junior prom his senior prom his high school graduation his college years his career his marriage his retirement and his golden years and it just goes on and on because of her crime, all of our fragile trust in one another has been further eroded. It's not an exaggeration to say that millions of people throughout the world have heard of this crime and will as a consequence be less trusting and more suspicious of those in whose care they entrust their children, even those who have loved and cared for their children for years. And because of her specious, cynical, calculated use of the NGRI defense in this case, those who are truly mentally ill will be treated with more suspicion and may not receive the help that they need. 
the reverberations of her murder of Gannon will ripple throughout eternity. And the impact of her crime is truly incalculable. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Allen. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Judge. It's Veronica Birkenstock, spell V E R O N I C A, Birkenstock B I R K E N S T O C K. I am Landon's aunt, Veronica, or Aunt V. And his great aunt. Nothing in life prepares you for the murder of a child. No one ever thinks this can happen to your family. A little over three and a half years ago, I got a call. A very dreaded call that I needed to come and be with Landon. For over three years, I have dear left her side and all the hearings, all the motions, and all the hearings that the defendant decided not to come to because she didn't think it was important. But regardless, we showed up and we showed up for Gannon. I want to talk about forgiveness today because as a Christian, I have to forgive, not because I want to, because this human flesh does not want to. The judge today, on behalf of Landon and I, we want this court to know that we have forgiven Letitia for what she did. God is the ultimate judgment, judger. But I pray today that you judge will give her what she deserves on this earth and let God do the rest in eternity. I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but I would like to leave this Bible. And at some point in time, if you think it's okay to give to Letitia as she serves her life sentence, and we hope that will be a punishment that you render shortly. But this is a life application Bible. For the rest of her natural life, I hope she will read the word of God. And I hope that she will turn from her evil ways and the things that she did to her family. I have sat here for six weeks and I have listened to the horrendous things that she did to my nephew. I don't want the last memory of him to be what she did to him. Her last memory of Gannon was one of fun, love, joy. So articulate and despite everything, he was gifted and intelligent. He wasn't supposed to live. The day he was born, the doctors told us he had really no chance. He weighed one pound and a few ounces. I'll never forget the picture that Albert sent when he took his wing ring and it would fit all the way to his shoulder. For months, I saw Landon and Albert pray over their baby. And the one of the happiest days was the day he got to come home. And I was there with them. I had to spend the first night holding him for the first time and looked in his beautiful eyes and he fought so hard to get there. His 11 years did have impact. And I want us to remember again, and it's who he was, not what this evil deed did to his memory. He is our hero and will always be our hero. Letitia tried to steal many things from my niece. She called her a drug addict. She called her homeless when she was in the hospital having her third child. She was there for months and months trying to save her life and her baby. She wasn't homeless. Landon's a good mother. She loved her children. And she loved Gannon. And her only son was taken away by someone who was just ferociously jealous of my niece. With all that being said, I pray that you will give her the sentence that she deserves, but I also pray that God will forgive her if she repents and turns from her evil ways. All right. Thank you. Mr. Allen. Uh, my name is Bob Rogers, B-O-B. R O G E R S. Um, my wife Patty and I are grandparents to um, Lena and Gannon, who we never had the opportunity to meet in person. Over the past couple of years, there's been a lot of tears and challenges uh, with Al, if we hopefully uh, helped him walk through this tragedy. Um, the person that comes to mind for me is Lena. 
Lana is Gannon's younger sister. And uh, we have the opportunity to be grandparents to her. And she's a beautiful child. She sings <laughs> beautifully. She's talented. What she doesn't have is an older brother to stand beside her as she goes through her life. She still mentions Gannon quite often, her brother. We never want the spirit of Gannon or the memory of Gannon uh, to be lost. So um, I just uh, am a loss for words. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I am Deborah Pierce, P E A R C E. Sorry. Gannon's grandmother. And I just wanted to thank you, first of all, Your Honor, for this court and everything that's been done for everyone who has so carefully and impartially cared for this case, for this loss of this precious child. And I feel that if Gannon were here today, he would say, please, please protect my family and be concerned for the loss that they've had. Um, this has gone from my children to my grandchildren, little children who lost a cousin who never understood why something like this could happen. If he were here today, he would say, please take care of my family. Make sure that they're protected as, as time goes on and as, as life goes on. Um, and obviously to help us to go forward in this life. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Oh boy, prepare yourself, guys. This is tough. I think Landon is going to talk now. Hmm. Hello, Your Honor. Um, my name is Landon Bullard, also referred to as Hyatt in this case, but Bullard's B U L L A R D. I miss you, Gannon, and I love you to the moon and back and back again. I know every day you're with me. And your sisters, but that will be never that will never be taken away. The ache that I have for you to hold you, to hug you, to tell you how much I love you and to see your smile in your innocence. I remember all the pain your dad and I suffered with having children. It was never easy and we were always fearful through the process. On September the 29th, 2008. Our lives were forever changed. Our first biggest blessing came into the world, weighing only one pound and six ounces. You fought all the odds and developed a personality and a smile that's larger than life. You became my hero that day. You forever changed my heart and my life, and that will never change. That is something that can never be taken away from me. You came into this world fighting. And unfortunately, you left this world fighting. Your Honor, she fought against someone that he loved and trusted. Someone that myself and Albert both trusted and loved. Someone who can never understand what it means to love or trust anyone but herself. For more than three agonizing years, I've often wondered what I may say. Or if I would even be able to. For three years, I have questioned every single possibility and scenario. For three years, I have tried to forgive you, but I can't. I want to. But no parent should have to bury their child. 
no parents should have to see or hear the horrific things you have done to the whole family. She has taken away the most precious gift in this world, not just my family, not Al's family, but your own family. She destroyed dozens of lives, lives of people who never wanted to believe that she could have done this. She knew how special Gannon was, and she knew what me meant to most of me. I in my heart can never understand her hatred and insecurities. When it came to me, I did love her. Mother to mother, I trusted her with my children while trying to survive a complicated life with my third child. And you used, she used every opportunity to write a narrative of my life to, again, to try to take pieces of my life. When she already took some of it, that still wasn't enough. She searched. I lost my place. <laughs> I don't know where I'm at now. You search, she searched so hard for love when all along she had it, but she took it for granted. I didn't hold anger against you then. I still kept my heart open to her. She had so, you had so much love from Lena and Gannon, from Harley, her own daughter, that you will willingly, you willingly subjected to the chance of serving time for her crimes. Such an indicator of her inability to love anyone herself. You had support, appreciation for me, even when we couldn't see eye to eye, because I valued her for helping, her, helping me with our children when I physically couldn't. Even when I was fighting for my kids, as you wrote, a false smear campaign against me and my children, and also Al. For me, I still appreciated that they were loved by you. So I thought. She had everyone fooled. She pro projected abuse and addiction claims against all of us, not just me, when all along she was the one harming innocent children. Anything to take the light off manipulating us, breaking my kids, and murdering my son. I can't say that she ruined my life because that would be some form of sick victory for her. Because even through this process, it's been a game to her. The people who listened doesn't know her style or her sly jabs. She's even made it Albert and I. They know they do not know the significance of certain things she says or does. But we do. Instead of allowing her to take that power of hurting me further, I wanted to tell you this. Let me tell you what Gannon has done. Even to this day, even after you murdered him and she tried to taint any positive image of him, he has caused families and communities to come together. Children and adults have given their life to Christ. He has called unity in times of trial. He is a hero. You even She even tried to steal that away. A cape, huh? The one image of Gannon that was created for the world after it went national. TV begging for the return of my son, my hero. How dare her? How truly sick and cruel is she? You stole so much from this world. Gannon's cousins, aunts, uncles, sisters, new siblings, grandparents, and friends are missing a huge portion of their lives without Gannon. Lena is missing her brother. Your Honor, I've never seen a bond between two siblings so close as theirs. She had to take that. Why? I'm afraid we may never know that answer, will we? I show his baby sister, Nova, pictures and videos of Gannon so she will always remember who he is because she stole him from us. He is not forgotten and never will be. And it's so sad to sit here today and face her, a person even Gannon loved, one that I know while she was attacking and killing him and fought for his life, he defended himself against her, still loving her. A love she never deserved from him for what she has done. While you are, while she is too much of a coward to even come forward with the truth, she owes it to Gannon. But the lack of remorse and the lack of respect to Gannon through this child, her lack of compassion shows me that she and we, well, we were all wrong. She manipulated all of us, all of us, and never loved Gannon, Lena, or Harley. 
I've sat here for over a month having to listen to her sick lies, even as she tried to destroy who I was and Albert at, as a father. I've had to sit and listen and watch every reenactment of images no one wants left in their mind. You wanted to leave us with that, knowing it would torture us. But you underestimated me. I am Landon, Gannon's mom, and that will never change. Through my hurt, anger, and pain, I will never be the monster that she is. I can never be filled with the hate that her heart holds. I pray that we will never have to look at her face again. I will continue to hold on to my faith. Vengeance is not mine as I surely wish it could be at times, but it's the Lord's. I have to trust in that. Thank you, Judge Warner, for your compassion, your patience through this trial. I want to thank the juror for their attentiveness and time that they took for joy, justice for my boy, to the detectives, officers, legal team for every single second they've poured out into Gannon's case, and to the community for your countless hours. Tisha, that was her biggest mistake. You underestimated this community and this defensive team, Lorson Ranch. They searched for and fought for Gannon within hours, and they never believed your lies from the moment they started. None of these people ever gave up on him. You never looked. All of these people I will forever hold close to my heart. Always getting strong. My gene men forever. Justice has been served today. Your Honor, I pray that you just give her the best sentencing, the longest sentencing that you can. <clears throat> this will not bring my son back, but I can sleep soundly for the first time in three years knowing that you can never harm, this defendant can never harm anyone again knowing Gannon will always be a true hero in a cape. He will always be my son. That will never be taken away. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Allen. Once I was seven years old, my mama told me, don't. Make yourself some friends or you'll be lonely. Once I was seven years old. It was a big, big world, but we thought we were bigger. Pushing each other to the limits, we were learning quicker. Al Stauk, Gannon's father, capital F A T H E R. Last name Stauk. S T A U C H. Uh, I'm going to start with um, something from my wife, not to go out of order, but she yep. didn't think she could make it through it. So this is my wife, Melissa, and these are her words. Some may say or think that I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Tisha. In part, that may be accurate, and I would be okay with that. Because then Gannon would still be here. I, too, know the pain of losing a child. And there is no greater pain. We are now lifelong grief partners. As this is a lifelong journey of pain with two sons waiting for us in heaven. <sighs> I have some words from my daughter, Elena, I will uh, address in the middle of my speech, but they're written in yellow, so I don't know if I should leave it to a child. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever God may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but I'm bowed. Beyond this place of the wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. The poem I read is named Invictus, translated from the Latin means unconquerable. 
I quoted this same poem at Gannon's Memorial here in Colorado Springs back in August of 2020. Why August of 2020? When his body was ripped to shreds on January 27th? Well, as we heard testimony to, his body was found 1,370 miles away. And then the process to identify his maggot-infested remains was held in from us until July 2020. As I stated in my testimony on the stand, Gannon was support, born severely premature and barely filled my two hands the first time I held him. At the end of his life, after his body was cremated into a pile of ashes, he was ultimately no bigger than the first time I held him. As brutal as the weight became, I'm thankful to God and the bridge workers for finding him and returning his precious body to Landon and I. I quote the poem Invictus again, not to boast of my strength and perseverance, Your Honor, but to say to the world, I alone can control my actions and reactions. Your Honor, I refuse to allow anger to poison my soul and orient my life to a pursuit of vengeance. I refuse to allow pain to carry me through each day and promote the pursuit of medicinal retribution toward the offender. I refuse also to let my mind be clouded by inconsistency and emotions that deter me from the purpose in this life. You honor the price I pay each and every day for this resolve is to only get pieces and parts of my son. consistently through time but the pain is too heavy and the anger too overwhelming and the desire for vengeance too vexing instead each and every day i pursue peace i seek joy in my life and let the love i have for my wife and family flow in and out of me like a mighty wave as i told tisha regularly at the end of our relationship my joy is mine alone and she cannot rob me of that I will learn to experience G more and more as time goes on, but as I did my best to instill into his precious soul, love, joy, service, and kindness are the pathway to take in life. This picture shows that in the fourth grade, he already had a mind for service. I think that concludes the uh, comment from family and friends, Judge. So I'm not sure if you're ready to hear sentencing comments from me or if you want to do a different process. Um. I let me hear the sentencing comments from you. The last person that I always hear from in a sentencing is the defendant. So okay. can I have just a moment? Then? You may go ahead. I guess she, what do you think she's going to say something, you guys? Yeah, just uh, in the abundance of caution, I would ask the court to keep restitution open for a period of time. Um, obviously, Mr. Stout is not asking for any restitution, but there may be some that we want to submit. And so I would ask the court to keep that open. Well, based on um, the uh, new case regarding timelines, I'm going to give you uh, 49 days to submit an order. Thank you. Um, if there is an objection, you'll need to file the objection within 14 days after that. And that'll get us all right. So 49 days, uh, 14 if there's an objection. And if there is, we'll have a hearing. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Judge, I'm not going to uh, make a long drawn out statement. I think the comments from the family and friends of the Stout family um, said it better than I ever could about the impact that Gannon had on their lives, um, the loss of, of Gannon from his family and to this community uh, will never be made right through this process. We all know that. The defendant through her own actions Tore Gannon's family apart. Tore this community apart. And at the same time, I've never seen a community come together the way this community did in the face of such tragedy. Over an 11 year old boy who most of us never knew. The defendant manipulated this community, Gannon's family, the investigation. I've been a prosecutor for a long time, Judge. You've seen a lot of cases. I've never seen the kind of horror that this defendant brought down on a community and a family. The torture that Gannon had to suffer in the last moments of his life are unspeakable.
no matter what sentence you give us, Judge, and I, and I know what that sentence is going to be for the most part, no matter what the sentence is, we'll never bring Gannon back. But it will go a long ways towards healing, healing this community. I hope healing Landon. I hope healing Al. They're going to live the rest of their lives second guessing every decision they made as it relates to leaving their children in the care of this defendant. Through no, no fault of their own. Judge, on count one and count two, uh, count two merges into count one. The only sentence available is life in prison without parole. As to count four, tampering with a deceased human body, driving Gannon's body over 1,300 miles away, hiding it from view, hoping it would never be found, as for the maximum sentence of 12 years, Judge, and that it be running consecutive to the life in prison without parole. Tampering with physical evidence is an F6. It's one to one and a half years. I ask that you give max on that as well and run that consecutive. Judge, we do have that other pending case, 20 CR 3170 hanging out there. In the grand scheme of things, um, well, I'd love to prosecute this defendant for that charge as well. Uh, in the interest of justice, I would like to see this defendant in Department of Corrections custody as soon as possible. And so we are dismissing that count or that charge. Thank you, Judge. All right, at this point in time, uh, the defense has an opportunity uh, to uh, present uh, statements in mitigation. Mr. Tellini. I don't have three cents confinement. Coach staff said she ordered that she be allowed to cheat it. Uh, give me an order. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, Ms. Stauk, I heard what your attorney had to say, but I need to hear it from you. You have a right to uh, address the court at this point in time regarding any uh, matter that you want me to consider for sentencing. Do you have anything that you wish for me to consider, ma'am? All right. Actually, there is. Go ahead. Consider this or request to permit reflect the request for Purdue Place in San Carlos. I don't have the ability to do that. Um, DOC determines uh, where uh, its inmates go, um, and I'm not going to make a recommendation one way or the other. Um, and I, I'm going to apologize before I do this. Um, I've heard a lot. Uh, I want to take about ten minutes to put my thoughts in order. Um, I'll come back with my sentencing at 325. All rise. A parent's worst nightmare is getting a phone call letting them know that something has happened to their child. How much worse must that nightmare be when law enforcement asks not for a picture of your loved one, but rather DNA and dental records? I've also heard it said that one of the worst tragedies a parent can experience is to outlive a child. I have known people both professionally and personally who have gone through that. It never leaves them, but the sharpness of the pain does diminish to some extent over time. 
I cannot fathom the pain Mr. Stauk and Ms. Bullard have experienced as a result of the defendant's actions. A sentence in a criminal case such as this will not change the fact that their son's life was taken from them and no sentence I impose and nothing I say will ever change that fact. Ms. Stauk, you betrayed the person you loved enough to marry. You told your husband lies and took away someone he loved. You took away every day that Mr. Stauk or Ms. Bullard could have had with their son. When you take a life, regardless of how you do that, you forever alter the future. Neither Mr. Stout nor Ms. Bullard will ever see their son graduate from high school, go through the joy and the pain of that first love, or get married. They will never know what kind of impact their son may have had on the world if only he had lived to become an adult. And had Gannon's body not been found, they never would have known what happened to Gannon. They would always have had a lingering doubt about what happened to Gannon. And I cannot imagine the pain and sense of loss associated with that. You betrayed your daughter, Harley Hunt. I cannot imagine the emotional impact that you have had on her due to your selfish and calculated actions. This is a young woman that trusted you to put her interests above yours. This is a young woman who believed in you and believed you were innocent of this crime right up until the time that you pled not guilty by reason of insanity. And she still loves you. That's natural for a child and it doesn't matter how much older they get. You were supposed to protect her. I cannot imagine the guilt she feels or the therapy that she will need to address your portrayal. There is no evidence that she had anything to do with the murder or your cover-up of it, but some people still think that she is somehow involved. She wasn't. The incredible strength of will and courage that it took for her to come in and testify is amazing to me. But she did it because, as she said, it was the right thing to do. And while thankfully she didn't testify, let's not forget about Lena. You betrayed her too. You took her brother from her and forever altered her family dynamics. She will always wonder who she can trust and will always feel that loss. She was there the day you killed Gannon. His body was still in the house when she got back from school. At some point, you even claimed this eight-year-old girl helped you move her brother's body from the basement to the back of your car. That's just simply not true. As she gets older, Lena is going to want to know more, and she's going to want to know if there was something that she could have done to prevent this. I hope she comes to realize that she has no fault in all of this. You betrayed your stepson, and you took his life. You took away everything he was and everything he could ever become. I can't imagine the terror and confusion that he must have felt in the last moments of his life when he knew his life was being taken by someone he trusted to protect it. Your attempt to raise the claim that you did this because of your adverse childhood is also a betrayal of people that have mental health issues. It is no secret that there is a large part of our population that has mental health issues. It's also no secret that our country and our health system could do a much better job addressing mental health issues than it does. However, the number of people with mental health issues who become violent is small. And the number who become murderers 
is smaller still. Your claim that a mental health issue caused the murder in this case is a disservice to all those who struggle with mental health issues every day. This isn't the first case I have presided over in which sanity or a mental condition of the defendant has been raised as a defense. I have had cases where the defendant's mental condition caused the defendant to act out in a certain fashion. But even in those cases, I have never seen conduct like this. I understand the claim of disassoci dissociative identity disorder. I have seen something resembling that, and I have seen defendants with schizophrenic disorders. I can understand those. What I have seen is that the mental condition causes the person to act a certain way, and when they realize what they did, they are astonished by what happened, or they have no memory of what happened. Your claim is that it was another personality that murdered Gannon, but there is no time during the minutes, hours, and days following the murder where Letitia came out and wondered, gee, why am I carrying a body around in my luggage? That just isn't credible. You knew what you were doing. You made a number of clear and conscious decisions to cover or disguise what you had done. Claiming a lack of motive is a common defense tactic, and it can be a sound strategy. The truth is, however, that it only takes a moment to make a bad decision that results in disastrous consequences. And oftentimes, we never know why a defendant chose a particular course of action. However, that does not mean that they did not intend to undertake a course of action. Sometimes, as in this case, the likely explanation is anger. An 11-year-old boy with burns who feels that he's not being taken care of. An 11-year-old boy on the verge of being a teenager. Those of us who have lived through people or kids with, uh, that were teenagers, we know how that is. It is not hard to imagine Gannon saying something, you're not my mom. I want my mom. I want my dad. And that would be enough to make you really angry. But anger is not an excuse. A defendant is responsible for the choices they made and the actions they undertook, even though those choices arose out of or, remote, or were motivated by anger. It's clear that you hated and were jealous of Landon and Bullard. You saw yourself as a better mother than she was. It's clear from the evidence that you had some resentment from being left with Mr. Stout's children. It's clear you had some resentment toward Mr. Stout because he traveled as part of his job. Some of that manifested as early as Al's assignment in Alaska when you made allegations against the people in his unit. That caused Al to have to return from Alaska. And in one of the phone calls that were played for the jury, you talked about having to take care of his kids while he was away and what a good mother, were, uh, what a good mother you were. It's clear you felt trapped. You wanted out. You were searching for a new job and a new location in Florida. Mr. Stauk had been gone on his, on his new assignment for less than two days when the fire in the basement occurred. I can imagine that you saw your whole future consisting of taking care of Mr. Stauk's children while he was off doing his thing, and that's not the future that you wanted. I can imagine Gannon at some point after he sustained his burns telling you you wanted his real mom and how that comment would have made you angry. You took your frustration and anger for the marriage, the child care, the absence of Al, and even living in Colorado. You took all of that out on Gannon. The evidence suggests you first stabbed Gannon repeatedly, 18 times. Based on the number of defensive wounds, he was clearly conscious for some of that. He was certainly gravely wounded. And chillingly, 
It would also explain how you were able to mimic the sound of Gannon breathing in one of your sessions with Dr. Lewis. Those were probably close to his last breaths. He was dying, but not dead. The evidence could also lead one to conclude that he either fell or rolled off the bed where you shot him in the head and then beat him with the butt of a gun or a baseball bat. That would explain the blood found at different levels on the walls in Gannon's bedroom. I'm also reminded of the look you had on your face when you slipped your handcuffs while being transported back to Colorado and attacked Deputy James. I shudder to think that that was probably the last thing that Gannon saw before he died. You have shown no remorse throughout this process. Instead, you've made a choice to build a web of lies. When you gave an interview to Detective Jessica Bethel on January 29 of 2020, you told her you lied to her about Gannon running away and that he was actually taken by a guy named Eduardo. When you explained that to Detective Bethel, you said you needed to lie because you didn't want to face the consequences. You told her that you were trying to come up with a plan about what you should do. And finally, you told her you really thought you could fix this. I think that's true. You lied because you didn't want to face the consequences. You needed to come up with a plan to fix this, and that plan involved covering up what you had done. It involved lie upon lie. But you slipped up at various points and let kernels of truth escape. In one conversation with Mr. Stauk, you told him the FBI needed to close the borders of Colorado, needed to close I-95. I-95 doesn't go through Colorado. It's an interstate that runs along the entire eastern seaboard. It's also not far from where you dumped Gannon's body. When questioned by Detective Bethel, you told her that Mr. Stauk might also make up some kind of story about you coming at him with a knife. He said you would never use a knife like that. Yet Gannon was stabbed 18 times. Your actions in this case also show a very conscious attempt to avoid responsibility in this case. You started out with the story that Gannon had run away. You gave some hints that it might be related to bath salts or drug use by Gannon. You stayed with that story until you were called into uh, EPSO for an interview. You knew they weren't going to buy the story that Gannon ran away. Then you came up with the abduction. And you stayed with some iteration of that for a long time. But all of those versions had one thing in common. You were always the victim. In one, you're beaten and raped and Gannon was abducted. In one, someone stole Gannon out of a truck in the parking lot. In another, you let Gannon, uh, someone drive Gannon to a hospital to take care of a head injury that he had after falling off a bike. In all of them, you could claim it wasn't your fault. You were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Then you got arrested. You stuck to the story that it was someone else that took Gannon. During the hours that you spoke with Special Agent Grusing, he told you he thought sometimes good people do bad things and sometimes it's an accident. Then they found Gannon's body. Then you saw the mountain of evidence against you. And this is a mountain the size of Everest. What was your position after that? Well, it was an accident. And you, Leticia, didn't even do it. It was Maria Sanchez. You carefully crafted your new story to continue to avoid responsibility. It also allowed you to take advantage of the out that Mr. Grusing and Mr. Stout suggested much, much earlier when they asked you if this was an accident. Now it was an accident. Your Maria Sanchez personality shot Gannon by mistake because she thought he was an intruder in a cape. 
Multiple personalities is not credible in this setting, as regardless of how many personalities you have, you only have one body. I have presided over cases where a mental disease or defect prevented a defendant from remembering the course of events, including the commission of the crime. Without exception, those defendants have been terrified when contacted by law enforcement because there was a period of time in their lives that they could not account for. Their body may have sustained an injury and they don't know how it happened. They may have some new object in their house or on their person, and they have no idea where they got it from. We all have free will, and we all make choices based on that free will. The people who suffer from the mental disorder you claim are terrified because their free will has been taken from them, and they are subject, being subjected to things and experiences they don't understand and don't have any recollection of. You didn't behave anything like that. One of the purposes is to impose an appropriate sentence for the criminal conduct that occurred. Another purpose is to punish an offender by imposing a sentence that takes into account the seriousness of the offense. Yet another purpose of sentencing is to prevent crime and promote respect for the law by providing an effective, an effective deterrent to others likely to commit a similar offense. Anyone who's been in my courtroom before knows that I've said sentencings are the most difficult thing that I do. That's especially true in cases where someone has lost his or her life. Nothing I or the law can, uh, can do will ever bring that person back. I have handled hundreds, if not thousands of criminal cases over the years. I think at this point in my career, I've presided over something like 200 jury trials. I've sentenced hundreds more defendants pursuant to plea agreements. This is not the first murder case that has come before me. This is not the first case I have presided over which involves harm to a child. This is not the first case I have had where a person who was in an unhappy marriage committed a crime. Sadly, statistically, there is a high correlation between violent acts, including uh, murders and family members. I have had a number of cases which have demonstrated one person's capacity for cruelty toward another human being. I can, however, say without hesitation that the facts in this case are the most horrific I have ever seen. Your conduct in this case deserves the maximum punishment that I can impose under Colorado law. As such, with respect to the charge of first degree murder after deliberation, I remand you to the custody of the Colorado Department of Corrections for the remainder of your life with no possibility of parole. With respect to the charge of murder in the first degree of a child under 12 by a person in a position of trust, I remand you to the custody of the Colorado Department of Corrections for the remainder of your life with no possibility of parole. Those two sentences will merge. If you have questions about that, you can ask your attorneys. With respect to the charge of tampering with a deceased human body, I'm also going to sentence you to 12 years, followed by a three-year period of parole. That sentence is to be consecutive to the life sentences that I've already imposed. With respect to tampering with physical evidence, I'm going to impose an 18-month sentence. That sentence is also consecutive. Uh, to the murder charge, to the sentences for the murder charges that I have imposed. I also understand with the consent of the prosecution, and I'm assuming no objection from the defense, that I will dismiss all the charges in 20 CR 3170, close that out, subject to restitution, give the people uh, 49 days for restitution, 14 days for response, and if there's an issue, we will set it within the 90 days, uh, within 90 days from. I think that resolves all outstanding matters. Is there anything else that the prosecution wishes for me to address? No, Your Honor, thank you. Defense? Yes. Court will be in recess. Yes. <laughs> oh, my word.
cover. Done. Wow, just like that. Thank you, Kimberly in Japan. Are you the Tokyo Grizzly? Oh my word, you guys. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, let's just fix this quickly. I'm just like, what? That was amazing. Sorry for this now. Just hold on. Okay, mic check. <laughs> no words. That was incredible. Amazing. <laughs> Life imprisonment with no possibility for parole. I can't even clap any louder. <laughs> it's like, she's cuffed. Yeah, she's cuffed. But I just mean, <laughs> we want to see it more. Like, cuff her. Just get out of there. Goodbye. I just, I can't, I can't, I can't. Okay. Wow. Streaming in a moment like this is kind of hard because I'm just like, <laughs> I feel like you guys are feeling, what do I say? That was just like, wow. I think the other charge they're talking about, you know, this other charge they're talking about, when we read through that whole binder, right? The probable cause affidavit and that whole binder of new things. There was that one charge they added for trying to or conspiring to escape because she was talking about measuring the window and trying to escape with a broomstick, all that crap. I, I think it could be that. But oh my word. And I just, that was the most powerful statement I can imagine from a judge. What a hero, honestly. What a... <laughs> Stefan said, not goodbye, just adios. <laughs> adios. I'm frozen. Okay, I'm freezing up because I'm just like so excited. Sorry, my computer. Hello, hello. Computer, can you handle it? Wow. Okay. So, stand by. I just want to see. That judge, he must have written that all weekend, don't you think? That wasn't just like, okay, let me just quickly make a speech. Some Throughout the trial, some of us in the chat we were joking a little bit like you know i just saw some of the chat saying i think the judge is like drafting his sentencing speech already well maybe he was because that speech was incredible wow yes she did have handcuffs i saw i saw okay saw the handcuffs but i just so wanted to see them like <laughs> i think i'm just imagining like cuff, cuff her even more drag her away just like i don't know i don't know it would have been just so good the last we saw now is her standing there new mugshot coming <laughs> Mugshot check for lad Tisha to see someone like that. Mm, mm. And Dr. Lewis, is she going to apologize to the mental health community? To anyone who actually has DID? Mm -hmm. oh, just enabling a malingerer. And I mean, Leticia's making faces even right there. I can get so snarky. Oh, my word. Okay. Thank you so much. True to it connections. If I missed anyone's stickers, I'm so sorry. I will check it later. There's a lot happening today. I couldn't be more excited. I, I, it's it's devastating. I mean, this case is absolutely devastating. An 11-year-old boy, Gannon Stuff. We will never forget him. Thank you all for being here and watching this with me, enduring every single day of the trial together. Wow. <laughs> I couldn't imagine a better judge's speech. The victim impact statements... Wow. Uh, Christina Alaska says assault on the officer. Oh, those charges too. Yeah, yeah. There's actually quite a few because there was some other. She was also charged in jail with wanting to escape, conspiring to escape. Assault on the officer and injury to Bethel. Those. They don't want to hold up her like going to prison. Oh, my word. I can't wait. Oh, my word. Just yes, yes. Check her in there. <laughs> Check her in. She'll be like, where's my kosher food? Mm, no, bye-bye. We don't have that here. Goodbye. <laughs> can't help. Thank you so much all for being here with me through it. I don't think I could have done it without you. It was amazing to have you here with me every single day. The Silver Leaf says, wish he would have given Elle's name back and stripped her of ever using it again. Maybe that'll still happen. I mean, although, can can, can they enforce that? I mean, I suppose. Why does she use it? That just bugs me so much. Blue Hearts for, for G-Man and Red for the Judge. Yes, she, I mean, I can't imagine how Harley feels. This must be quite something, right? Lulu says, shave her head. Please, shave her head. <laughs> yes, please. Wow. Okay. Thank you to all of you, even if you left for a bit because, you know, stuff, and you came back. Thank you so much. And to those of you, to the 10,000 of you who stayed here with me throughout the whole stream, throughout glitches, sound issues here and there, things happening, I don't know. 
thank you. I really appreciate it. You're very, very loyal and very nice. And I feel very supported through all of this as well. Okay, well, I don't really know what to do with myself now. I'm going to, I can't just like now, I want to, I want to talk to members soon, but let's do that maybe tomorrow or so, because now I just have to, <laughs> I want to process that. And I just want to go check out Elle's um, impact statement again, because there was a little bit that I missed. You guys were still hearing some things. I couldn't hear a thing. It just bombed out there. I think this stream, as I told you, this WebEx one was set up a little differently than before. So I was like, I don't know. There were a couple of glitches, a couple of things, but I'm so glad we saw most of it together there. Oh, Jean says, we love you, Gisela. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Angie, thank you so much. True to it, Connection says, excellent coverage. Now, don't worry, you guys. I um, I want. Thank you so much. I see a lot of you are like, what are we going to do now? And Oh, no. Like, I know we're all going to miss each other because I understand we've all been here for many hours every day. Now, that press conference, that I do want to see. Let's see if it is something. Is there something? Neon zebra spots. I love zebras so much. Thank you for reminding me, actually, of that, because I do want to see if there's something like that. Wait for it. Let's look. Let's look. CBS Colorado. I don't see anything there. If you have anything, send it to me on email, okay? No press conference, okay. I'm sure they're all exhausted after that. Delta Dawn says she needs to pay for therapy for everyone involved with this trial, <laughs> including us with her organs <laughs> broke the rule sorry <laughs> well don't worry the rule is don't use all caps in the whole sentence but it's okay if you mean just writing it there <laughs> with her organs she needs to pay i don't know man we need to now look at what that prison is like you know what is it like especially if we could find anyone who's ever been in it are the women you know are they quite tough you know on each other especially uh, child killers wow Yes, Alison says, I love that Gannon's mom was mentioned so many times. Her statement was so powerful. It was, it was. Okay, hold on. Before I go, just one second, please. I just quickly want to see if there's anything. Wow. That's amazing. Quite lots of detectives watching us and they say thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being so kind. Um, Roxy, thank you. Okay, so you guys, <laughs> here for the truth is, sorry, I felt like I was cheating on you, but I had to go hear the statements, then I came back. Don't worry at all. Don't worry at all. I understand completely. I would do the same. I'd be like, I have to hear this immediately. Um, <laughs> you got a whole pass. <laughs> Thank you so much. you like, I did keep checking. <laughs> Thank you for coming back. Um, Gina says, last super chat, I meant L. Okay, okay. And my miracle mama says, hey, hi, G. Thank you for the coverage. L's statement was echoed here. Can we watch together with you now i don't understand i think we should i just want to process some stuff i'm human too you know i gotta process all this maybe let's see what's happening tomorrow but maybe we could like tomorrow watch it all again <laughs> the victim impact statements maybe maybe i'll just want to see what it like i just want to process it all okay so celebratory time for us justice for ganon man what a day okay I love the community so much. I will see you all very, very soon. Thank you so much, mods. Thank you so much, patrons, members, subscribers, everyone. Really appreciate you. And I, I will see you again soon, okay? I'm going to go now, do a little happy dance, process all this, and I'll be back soon, okay? And I think I think we should process and rewatch because we're going to miss it. I, I, it's like so adrenaline-filled that you're like, what, 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 what? I think we should watch it, the whole victim impact statement again sometime. And maybe even the judge's speech again. I wouldn't mind reliving that. So let's see. Let's see. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, see you soon. Bye. <laughs>